So in this um, lecture, I want to spend a fair amount of time talking about energy. Energy is something that is critical for life. Um, it's necessary for cells to function. We think of energy as necessary for muscular movement in us. It's also uh, important for a transmission of information, cells communicating with each other, cells performing their uh, metabolic processes and so forth. So there's a lot of different reasons cells uh, need energy and so that's uh, what we'll be talking about here. So energy, um, of course, uh, is available to cells uh, as a result uh, of processes uh, that involve uh, the breakdown uh, of some substances and the uh, synthesis of other substances. So uh, in general, when we look at energy consideration, we have oxidation of substances. And the oxidation of molecules uh, leads to release of energy. We know, of course, if we take uh, a match and we light the match, uh, the fire that starts, of course, is happening as a result of oxidation. And we know that that fire that happens in oxidation uh, is releasing energy. The fire itself is hot, et cetera. Cells uh, use oxidation as well. But instead of using flames, which would, of course, uh, kill a cell, they uh, use very small oxidative changes, and those small oxidative changes release energy. Cells ga uh, ca uh, capture that energy uh, in chemical form. And so the chemical form uh, that they most commonly use uh, for energy is ATP. And so cells have means then of uh, grabbing that uh, energy uh, that's released in oxidation and con storing it. So they take ADP, which is a low energy form uh, of a molecule, and capture that energy and make ATP, which is a high energy form. Then when cells need to uh, do things like making molecules or contracting muscles or things like that, they use the ATP energy then for these processes to occur. And when they use that ATP energy, ATP is converted back to ADP. So we see sort of a cycle that's happening. Oxidation to make ATP, ATP used to make things happen. Well, that making things happen can also involve synthesis of molecules. So we have the breakdown of molecules, which is oxidation. We have the synthesis of molecules, which is largely reduction. So ATP is the intermediary in those processes. Well. We talk about the mitochondria uh, in eukaryotic cells as the power plant of the cell. And so I've depicted on the screen here uh, a mitochondrion. And we can see um, the reason that mitochondria, first of all, are called the uh, power plant of the cell is because it's in the mitochondrion in eukaryotic cells where probably 95 to 99% of the ATP that a cell uses is actually made uh, within here. So the mitochondrion has some important features that um, uh, you should recognize. And those important features uh, include uh, its overall general structure. So let's talk about some of those features uh, of the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion is a double membraned organelle, meaning it's got two membranes. It's got an outer membrane that doesn't play a very large role in the functions that we'll be talking about here. The outer membrane is what we call relatively porous meaning that molecules up to about 50,000 in molecular weight can readily pass through it. So it's not much of a barrier to molecules. On the other hand, the inner mitochondrial membrane, which is shown in sort of a lighter color uh, here, the inner mitochondrial membrane is very impermeable to molecules freely moving through it. That turns out to be a very important feature of the mitochondrion. Protons, for example, cannot readily move through the mitochondrion. ATP cannot readily move through the mitochondrion. NAD cannot readily move through the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. So that inner membrane of the mitochondrion okay, provides a barrier, and that barrier turns out to be very important for its function. Inside of the mitochondrion, we see these infoldings of the inner membrane. These are all part of the inner membrane, okay, but they're just folded inwards. And they're folded inwards to provide an increase in surface area of the inner membrane. And we'll see why that's important uh, in just a little bit. Those inner foldings are called cristae, C-R-I-S-T-A-E, okay? Uh, and as I said, they're just there to provide a lot more surface area of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Those infoldings still are barriers themselves. They don't let things readily pass through them. 
Well, on the far inner part of the membrane, there's obviously liquid in there because we are uh, aqueous organisms. We're 75% water. So this liquid that's in here in the membrane is the fluid of the uh, mitochondria, and it's where, we, uh, where is located what we call the matrix. So the matrix of the mitochondria contains a fluid we could think of it as sort of the cytoplasm of the mitochondrion. The cytoplasm, of course, is all located out here, but the cytoplasm is just a solution of the cell. The matrix is the solution of the mitochondrion. It's sort of like the cytoplasm of the mitochondrion. The enzymes of the mitochondrion okay, are largely dissolved in the matrix. There's only one enzyme um, that um, is significant. Um, uh, metabolically that is found um, in the membrane of the mitochondrion, although we're going to see many other proteins found in the membrane, but only one metabolic enzyme of note is found in the membrane. So we'll talk more about that as we get going along. All right, well, there's ATP. ATP, of course, as I said, is uh, one of the ways in which cells capture and hold on to energy uh, that is released in the process of oxidation. ATP is something people call the currency of the energy currency of the cell, meaning ATP can be made in one place and used in the cell in a variety of places, kind of like money can be earned at work but then used to buy things in stores, uh, etc. ATP, uh, we know, of course, has three phosphates. That's the triphosphate or the TP part of ATP. ATP contains ribose ring, it contains adenine, that's what this base is up here, okay? And it contains the three phosphates. The three phosphates are where the energy is stored in ATP. And the energy storage happens because these three phosphates are all negatively charged and they all repel each other. But, and this is the important uh, point about this, but these three phosphates are covalently held together. So we can think of these three phosphates as like a tightly compressed spring. That when you release the spring, what happens? Doing, it blows out like that. So if I cut a bond between this second phosphate and this third phosphate, what's gonna happen? Well, that phosphate is gonna fly away because it's repelled by the negative charge here and now there's no covalent bond holding it together. I point that out because that is actually how energy stored in ATP is released. Okay, now there are other considerations for energy in terms of cells. And so we saw ATP had a sort of potential energy that was there. The potential energy was that the spring was compressed and we released it and energy um, uh, was um, uh, let go as a result of that. Other potential energies in cells are a little bit more subtle. So this shows a common energy potential found in cells known as electrochemical potential energy. Well, what does electrochemical potential energy mean? Well, we know, of course, that cells and cellular organelles, okay, have the shapes and have the structures that they have as a result of membranes that are found on their outsides. So our cells all have a cell membrane, and the cell membrane is largely a barrier. It's impermeable to movement of molecules across it. So I mentioned, for example, the mitochondrial inner membrane was impermeable to molecules that moved across it, right? Well, let's imagine that we have a situation where we have uh, a group of molecules like, like uh, potassiums uh, shown here, and those potassiums all have a positive charge. And we're on one side of the membrane here, and we're on the other side of the membrane here. If this membrane is impermeable to potassium, as it is as I show here, then if I have a higher concentration of potassium on one side than I have on the other, first of all, I have a difference in concentration of potassium, all right? And differences in concentration give rise to osmotic pressure. That's one kind of potential energy. And the fact that potassium is charged means that we have a difference in charge on one side versus the other. And that means we also have electrical potential. So when we talk about electrochemical potential across a membrane, we're talking about the fact that we have a higher concentration of one molecule or one atom, in this case, on one side versus the other. And if it's charged, 
then that charge gives rise to electrical potential as well. Now that turns out to be really important when we talk about how it is that a mitochondrion makes ATP. Well, this figure depicts uh, some fairly complicated processes that are occurring in the mitochondrion. And I show it as an overview for uh, some of the processes I'll be describing to you. There are two processes that are sort of interlinked, although they are independent as well, that result in the production of ATP. These processes occur in the membrane, the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. So to orient you here, the inner membrane of the mitochondrion is shown as this sort of rounded rectangular structure in the middle. The outer membrane of the mitochondrion is shown here, and it's shown here. It isn't shown wrapping around, but it ult ultimately would wrap around uh, as well. Okay? And if we look at the inner mitochondrial membrane, we can see embedded in it certain complexes, and those certain complexes uh, are numbered. Okay? So there's a complex one, there's a complex two, there's a complex three, and there's a complex four. And ultimately, there's a fifth complex, which is uh, over here, that is sometimes labeled as five and sometimes labeled in other ways. Now, complexes one through four, that is one, two, three, and four, are part of what we describe as the electron transport system. Okay? The electron transport system is half of the uh, way of making ATP. So the electron uh, transport system creates... As a result of its action, it creates an electrochemical gradient across it. Okay? So remember that electrochemical gradient had a difference in concentration of atoms, and it had a difference in concentration of charge. Well, on the last slide, the atoms that were involved were potassium. What happens in the mitochondrion is the atoms that are involved are not potassium, but instead they're hydrogen atoms or protons. Okay? So protons are the electrochemical gradient that's created by the electron transport system. So I'm going to explain to you how that happens. All right? This complex 5 that's over here is part of the second half of the system. It actually uses the electrochemical gradient to make ATP. So this complex 5, which is also called ATP synthase, this complex 5 uses the electrochemical gradient energy to synthesize ATP in a process we call oxidative phosphorylation. So two things happening here. Electron transport, electron transport, creating electrochemical gradient, and oxidative phosphorylation using that gradient to make ATP. So let's stop and take a look now at how that process actually happens. What you see on the screen is a close-up of the electron transport system. And it's a close-up of a part of the electron transport system. You can see um, some things happening here. So let's explain, let me explain to you what's happening in this overall process. You see, for example, on the left side, something called complex one. And complex one, uh, the overall process of electron transport starts in the matrix of the mitochondrion. So to orient you here, the matrix of the mitochondrion is here, which we can think of as the inside of the mitochondrion. The outside of the mitochondrion is up here, and it's what we call the intermembrane space. It's the space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane, which is up here, which isn't shown. Okay? So we have the matrix, the inner membrane, the intermembrane space, and the outer membrane, which isn't shown. Okay. Now, what's happening in electron transport? What's happening in electron transport is that electrons from an electron carrier are being dumped into complex one. All right? Well, the electron carrier that works with complex one is NADH. And so we can see NADH that is carrying electrons. Where did the NADH come from? Well, remember, we had cellular oxidation that made that. Oxidation of glucose produces NADH. Oxidation from the citric acid cycle and other oxidative processes produce NADH. As I've mentioned in class, NADH is a limiting resource. If cells don't 
recreate NAD, then all of their NAD will be left as NADH and they won't have a place to put new electrons and consequently oxidation will stop. Well, since oxidation is where the cell gets its energy from, there's problems. Well, it turns out that because of electron transport, NADH gets converted back to NAD and the recycling has happened. So the first thing that's important here is that NADH is donating its electrons to complex one and recreating NAD. So the cell's happy, it's got more NAD. Well, that's not this, the main significance of the electron transport system. The main significance is coming up. Remember that NADH dumped its electrons. Electrons come into complex one in pairs. That is two electrons at a time. Two electrons come into complex one and travel through it. So complex one is a complex. It's, it has several proteins. It's fairly big. It doesn't move in the inner membrane very readily. It pretty much is fixed. Okay. As the electrons move through complex one, something really interesting happens. Complex one is something that we call a pump. And so a cellular pump is something that takes atoms or molecules, in this case atoms, and moves them from one side of a membrane to another side of the membrane. In the case of complex one, movement of the electrons through complex one causes it to grab protons from the matrix and move them into the intermembrane space. Now, what effect does that have? Well, it's just created an electrochemical gradient because it reduced the concentration of protons in the matrix and increased them in the intermembrane space. That is the magic, the first part of the magic of the um, mitochondria. So this pump is working because electrons are moving through it. That's pretty cool. If we think about it, what's happening with any electronic device that we use? Our phone or this clicker or the camera that is taking this video. It's all happening because electrons are moving through it, those electrons in the form of electricity, right? Well, the cell is using electricity to create an electrochemical gradient that'll be useful for making ATP. This is a really remarkable thing. Well, the electrons pass through complex one, they've got to go somewhere. Electrons don't just disappear. We've got to account for them. Well, it turns out that this is a chain. The electrons, after they pass through complex one, go somewhere, and the place where they go is they go to um, a small molecule known as coenzyme Q, also called ubiquinone, okay? Coenzyme Q, ubiquinone, we'll use the terms interchangeably. Ubiquinone, or complex, I'm sorry, or coenzyme Q, grabs the electrons from complex one and passes them off to the next complex in the system known as complex three. Okay, I'll talk about complex two later, all right? So, coenzyme Q, we could think of as a ferry. Okay, ferries carry cars or people from uh, across water from one side, uh, from one piece of land to another, for example. We can think of one piece of land being complex one, we can think of the other piece of land being complex three, and the ferry that is shuttling things back and forth is coenzyme Q, all right? Now, coenzyme Q is not a pump. It doesn't pump any protons. It simply carries electrons from complex one to complex three. Now, it does something else that's kind of interesting. Com uh, coenzyme Q grabs the pair of electrons that came from complex one, and it carries them over to complex three, but instead of dumping them off as a pair, it dumps them off one at a time. If you're on a ferry and you ride that ferry and you get to the new land, they're going to say, okay, please exit single file, right? This is carrying electrons and it's letting them off single file, one at a time. That turns out to be important because complex one can accept electrons in pairs, but complex three and all the other complexes here can only accept electrons one at a time. It's for this reason I talk about coenzyme Q as being the traffic cop, okay? Accepting electrons in pairs, dropping them off one at a time. So 
Complex 3 is similar to Complex 1 in that it is a pump and that it has electrons pass through it. In this case, the electrons only pass through it one at a time. That one at a time really isn't important for its overall function. Its function as a pump, however, is important. So as the electrons pass through Complex 3, Complex 3, just like Complex 1, grabs protons from the matrix and pumps them out into the intermembrane space up here. Okay? So that means that like Complex 1, Complex 3 is favoring formation of an electrochemical gradient right here. Well, like complex one, complex three has got to do something with those electrons as well. And so when it's done with them, it passes them off to the next ferry in the system, or the next carrier in the system. And the next carrier in the system is a small protein known as cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is shown here. You can see that it's drawn as smaller than these complexes, and it's considerably smaller. It's also a single protein, whereas these complexes here are multiple proteins. And because it's smaller, like coenzyme Q, it can move readily in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And so it acts as a shuttle or a ferry carrying electrons from complex 3 over to complex 4. Like coenzyme Q, it doesn't pump any protons. It simply carries electrons from this big complex over here to this big complex over here. All right? Now, when cytochrome C carries, remember that cytochrome C is carrying one electron at a time. When it carries an electron over to complex four, the electron in complex four passes through it. And just like complexes one and three, complex four is a pump. And so, yep, you guessed what's going to happen. It takes protons out of the matrix, moves them out into the intermembrane space. So as a consequence of action of complexes 1, 3, and 4, the concentration of protons in the intermembrane space grows considerably. The concentration of protons in the matrix drops considerably. Okay? But there's a problem when we get to complex 4. Remember that complex one got done with the electrons, what did it do with them? It gave them to coenzyme Q. Complex three, when it finished with its electron, what did it do? It passed it off to cytochrome C. What does complex four do? Complex four doesn't have another carrier to send it to. It gives it to a molecule. And the molecule that it gives it to is molecular oxygen. Okay. So molecular oxygen, when it gains electrons, if it gains enough of them, becomes water, all right? It becomes water. So we actually see that happening right here. Oxygen, molecular oxygen, is what we describe as the terminal electron acceptor. It's the final destination of the electrons that are moving through the electron transport system. And after four electrons have made this move into complex four, a molecule of oxygen, O2, is converted into two molecules of water. Okay? Now that's really cool. You might get thinking about, well, when I go running, what am I doing? Well, when I get running, I am doing a lot of oxidation, I am doing a lot of capture of energy, I'm doing a lot of electron transport, and I'm needing a lot of oxygen. The reason I start breathing heavily is so that I can have enough electron acceptors in the form of oxygen to form water. So we can understand that part of our physiology as a result of um, the electron transport system. Okay. Okay. And so that's what's happening in electron transport. This figure shows the same thing that you saw in the last one, except for you'll notice that we start with complex two instead of starting with complex one. Everything else is the same. Coenzyme Q, complex three, cytochrome C, and complex four. The difference is that with complex two, something else is happening, okay? Instead of electrons from NADH, complex two accepts electrons from FADH2. So remember that FADH2 electrons, or FADH2 is produced by the citric acid cycle, among other things. And as a consequence, 
FADH2 has got to be converted back to FAD, and that happens as a result of action of complex two. All the other things happen, but notice, electrons are not going through complex one. And complex one was one of the pumps. So in the case of electrons coming from FADH2, only two of the three pumps actually function. That means that the electrochemical gradient that's up here, that's created by electrons starting with FADH2, is not as strong as the gradient, or not as big as the gradient, that happens when they started with complex one, because three pumps were involved with that. As a consequence, um, electrons that start from FADH2 passing through complex two do not create the same magnitude of, electron, uh, of electrochemical gradient as electrons that started from NADH and going through complex one, because only two pumps are active as opposed to three. Consequently, that since the electrochemical gradient is used to make ATP in the next step of the process, there's less ATP that can be made as a result of electrons coming from FADH2 than there is from electrons coming from NADH. Now another important consideration relevant to the electron transport system is the fact that there are molecules that can inhibit the transport system from happening. We know of some of these molecules as poisons. Okay? There are specifically three places where cells uh, can um, uh, be affected by chemicals that uh, inhibit movement of electrons and uh, through the electron transport system. So let me just say a brief word uh, about that. First, complex one is a target for some molecules, uh, one of the most common ones of which is known as rotenone. Rotenone um, is a compound that's produced by some plants as a defense mechanism, and it's produced because rotenone can inhibit complex one. Well, inhibiting complex one could have some severe uh, consequences, and it turns out that the consequences um, of that are most significantly seen in insects. So plants produce this as a defense mechanism against insects attacking them. What happens if rotenone is eaten by an insect? Well, the insect will not be able to uh, go through, uh, have electrons go through complex one, and as a result, it will not be able to convert NADH into an electrochemical gradient that can be used to make ATP. We could imagine this would have some significant consequences because stopping electron transport could cause problems, and it does. There are ways around that. We can think, for example, of complex two, which allows a movement of electrons from FADH2, but nonetheless, inhibiting this could cause a problem. Okay, so another molecule that can affect the electron transport system is antimycin A. Antimycin A affects complex three. And the consequences of the action of antimycin A are actually greater uh, than that of, of uh, uh, rotenone, for example, because it's working later in the chain. Antimycin A, if it um, is um, acting on a mitochondrion, will stop movement of electrons through complex three. The stopping of a movement of electrons through complex three will basically gum everything else up. Because if complex three can't move electrons, then coenzyme Q will have no place to put electrons, which means it will remain full of electrons. And if it remains full of electrons, then complex one will have no place to put electrons. And if it has no place to put electrons, then the cell cannot uh, release electrons from NADH and make NAD. So NADH will accumulate. And of course, that's ultimately gonna produce a problem because remember, cells need NAD for oxidation. And if all their NAD is in the NADH form, that's gonna be a problem. So an antimycin A can be uh, a poisonous substance. The most poisonous substances that we see are actually inhibitors of complex four. And so inhibitors of complex four include carbon monoxide and also cyanide. And what they do is they inhibit the movement of electrons through complex four. And just like we saw for complex three, if we inhibit the, <clears throat> excuse me, the movement of electrons through complex four, the entire system gums up and no electron movement whatsoever happens, okay? So that's one of the reasons why cyanide and carbon monoxide, as well as a compound called azide, 
are very, very poisonous substances. They completely stop electron transport from occurring. And since electron transport is necessary for the electrochemical gradient, the electrochemical gradient is necessary for the synthesis of ATP, and the recycling of NADH to make NAD is also stopped, all of these can be deadly to a cell. Now, I've been talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, the electron transport system. That's only half of the process of making of ATP. So we can think of the electron transport system as what I like to describe as charging the battery. Charging the battery means we're creating that electrochemical gradient. Higher concentration of protons in the intermembrane space than there is in the mitochondria. Well, so far we haven't talked about making ATP, so now that's what we're going to do. This is the process of oxidative phosphorylation. So oxidative phosphorylation is going to use that electrochemical gradient to synthesize ATP. As I uh, described earlier in the process, that um, synthesis occurs as a result of movement of protons through something called complex 5. Now notice that complex 5 is not a part of the electron transport system. Notice that no electrons are moving through complex 5, okay? It's very important in thinking about the electron transport system and oxidative phosphorylation to keep separate in your mind protons and electrons. In the electron transport system, electrons are moving and protons are being pumped, okay? The electrochemical gradient is being formed as a result of movement of those electrons, that's the electrical circuit. The electrochemical gradient refers to the fact that there's more protons outside than inside. Well, electrochemical gradients are, are essentially potential energy. We can think of if we take a ball and we put it at the top of a tall building, it has high potential energy. As long as it's sitting there, nothing happens. But if I push the ball off, it falls off of the building, and kinetic energy is resulting from that. The ball at the top of the building is this electrochemical gradient that we see here. These protons are going to fall through this device right here and do something really remarkable. They're going to cause this device to actually spin, and the spinning of this device is responsible for the synthesis of ATP. So this device is the complex five, also called ATP synthase. Now let's, before I talk about that, let's remember one very important fact I mentioned earlier. First of all, here's the inner mitochondrial membrane. We see complex five is embedded in it. Okay, one end of it up here, the other end of it up here. Some people describe this as a mushroom-like structure where this is the stem of the mushroom and this is the head of the mushroom down here. It's down here where the ATP is going to be made. Okay? The important point to remember about this system is that remember that the lipid bilayer of the inner mitochondrial membrane, this lipid bilayer, is impermeable to protons. Protons cannot move through the lipid bilayer by themselves. The only way that protons can move through the lipid bilayer is through a system that allows them to move, and that's complex five. Complex five is allowing protons to fall through it and synthesize ATP, okay? So how does that happen? Well, the falling through, uh, protons enter a little chamber over here <clears throat> Excuse me. And as a result of the entering of that chamber, there is, a ro there is a small rotor that is inside of here that spins. Okay? And as a result, the protons basically get shuffled all the way through the system, causing the spinning. And that rotor that's here sticks into the head of the mushroom down here. Okay? So movement of the electrons, electrons enter here. They cause, as they spin around, as they move through this upper portion, they cause the rotor that's in the middle and projects down into here to spin down here. It's the spinning of this rotor down here that will cause the ATP to be made. Now notice that the, 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 the head itself doesn't spin. It's the rotor that's inside of it that spins. That's the critical thing. 
Well, let's take a look at this from another perspective. The other perspective is shown here. The, we're looking here at the head of the mushroom, and we're looking at it from, compared to the last figure, essentially from the bottom looking up at it. All right? We're looking at it from the bottom looking up at it. There are actually six components okay, on that head. We're showing three of them, and we're showing the three that are responsible for making the ATP. The three components that are there are three copies of a protein, and the three copies of the protein are identical. The only difference between these copies is the structure that they have, and that structure varies depending upon which direction the rotor is pointing at them. Okay? It varies according to the way that the structure the, the, their structure varies according to the way that the rotor is pointing at them. Let's take a look at how that happens. So, the rotor, as I said, is changing, it's rotating, and as it changes, it changes the configuration of these. So let's look at one of these components here. We see this upper right component right here of this one, and it's labeled with an L, okay? As the rotor rotates, the L converts to a T, and we see the T here, and we see the T here, all right? Now, I'll explain what the L, T, and O each mean later, but for right now, L is different from T, and when the rotor rotates again, we see that the T changes to an O. Now, that movement from L to T to O is something that happens in all of these. Remember, these three proteins are identical. So depending upon which way the rotor is, is facing, each one is either in an L configuration, a T configuration, or an O configuration. And at any given time, one component is in L, one component is in T, and one component is in O. Rotating the rotor changes L to T, changes T to O, and changes O to L. Okay? L, T, O, L, T, O, L, T, O. Well, what, do, what is the function of each of these? It turns out that T is the configuration where ATP is made. Right? So in the T configuration, an ADP is brought into close proximity with a phosphate. And they are literally squeezed together. And it's the squeezing together of them in the T that's tight, Okay, that tight configuration squeezes them together and makes ATP. So in the T, ADP and phosphate are joined together to make ATP. Okay, what is the function of the O? Well, the O follows from the T. Notice that the T goes to the O. The O is the open form. So after the ATP has formed, the next step converts the T to the O, so it opens, and when it opens, what does it do? It releases the ATP. So the ATP that was made here is released here. Okay. The next step in the process for this O, for example, is to convert it to an L. What is L? L is the loose configuration, and L is the configuration where an ADP and a phosphate bind. So after L, okay, then what happens? The next step is going to be T. So what happens then is if we think about it, we start with, let's say, the open, where there's nothing in there, the ATP has been released, move to the L, that's where the ADP and the, P, the phosphate are um, uh, binding, and the T, where they're squeezed together. Then, oh, they're released. So we can see that happening through all of these systems here. And every one of these subunits will sequentially go L to T to O to L to T to O. And that's how the vast majority of ATP is made inside of your body. Now, um, a molecule, there's actually a molecule I talked about inhibitors of the electron transport system. There's also a molecule here called oligomycin. Uh, which can inhibit the movement of protons through complex 5. Oligomycin will stop oxidative phosphorylation.